we had four venture capitals that invested, but we had lots, dozens that rejected us. And I remember one of the venture capitalists rejecting us, and he, for some reason, felt it was important to tell me why he wasn't going to invest. He said, to me, it looks like you're just a bunch of hippies selling food to other hippies. I really don't think that's a very big market. And just in case I'm wrong, I don't think you can compete with Safeway. Those guys will put you out of business. The depth of feeling that was there, the depth of feeling that said this is the right thing to do, was there from the beginning. We're always asking questions nobody has ever thought of asking or had the guts to ask or bothered to ask. I was in and out of college, the University of Texas, several times. I don't know, I think I counted up six times I've, I dropped in and out. I moved into this vegetarian co-op, uh, housing co-op, when I was about 22 or 23. And I wasn't a vegetarian, but I thought it would be fun. I thought I'd meet a lot of interesting people. So I moved in, and I had my food consciousness awakened. I became a vegetarian. I learned how to cook. I became the food buyer for the co-op. I had found my calling in a way because I was just, this was something I became very passionate about. The whole natural food thing really got started in the early to mid 70s. That's when I think people began to push back against the over-industrialization of food that particularly coming out of World War II, the use of pesticides that were used in the military were start to be used for the food production. Agriculture is going far beyond nature to produce new miracles for an even better, more abundant life. And so you had this in the 50s and the 60s. You had the you know processing of sugar and flour. Freezers were introduced. So you had prepackaged frozen meals. Those never existed prior to World War II. People said, OK, we got to go a different way. We're starting to affect the land, and we're starting to affect people's health. So the natural foods sort of revolution was born. I said, you know what? I'm really interested in uh, this whole question about how to make food more whole. And so I decided to start a small natural food store, which I did in 1977 in a little town called Weaverville, California that no one's ever heard of. It was only 1,000 square feet. Uh, and uh, we did a couple hundred dollars on the first day. In uh, 1974, I started working in a little macrobiotic food store in Boston called Erwan. And while I was there, I met the uh, future owner of Bread and Circus. Two years later, when I was looking for a job, uh, I went to him and I got a job stocking groceries and running the cash registers. I think I started at $3 an hour. At that time, it was, it was pretty small niche kind of business. I uh, really hadn't hit the mainstream, really hadn't spread out beyond that group of people who were uh, kind of really interested in grains and beans and real basic eating. I talked to my girlfriend who was at the co-op and asked her if maybe uh, we should do our own store. And she got excited about the idea. and. In a year, we'd opened up our own store and, and called it Safer Way. I first met John Mackey in 1967. We were uh, freshmen in high school at uh, Memorial High School in Houston, and I uh, met him on the basketball court. So in 1978, I invested some money in, in uh, what was uh, to be called Safer Way. On some level, I knew that, that John was very intelligent person and very driven person and a very conscientious person. So I felt that even though most businesses fail, I thought that maybe this might have a chance of succeeding. Safer Way was capitalized with $45,000. We lost half of it in the first 12 months we were open, probably because Renee and I did not have a clue of what we were doing. Renee and I were living in the duplex and it was uh, served as a warehouse. So we would order food and it would get delivered to the house. And then I would load up the, the Safer Way van, which was this old postal mail truck, and stock out the store. And, and that worked really good until our landlord came in one day and, and he, he evicted us immediately. Anthony was a bit of a visionary. And he knew that if we were going to really try to appeal to more the mainstream shopper, 
that we needed a store that looked like a supermarket and shopped like a supermarket. So in 1979, he found this 10,000 square foot store in Cambridge that really became the first natural food supermarket in the country. We started to see people come in and really shop it. People from the neighborhood would use it as a, as a neighborhood grocery store. In fact, I know John Mackey came up to see it and liked the idea so much that he came back to Austin and joined forces with a couple of partners and they opened up the first Whole Foods in 1980. We, we did lose uh, roughly half of our investment in, in the first year and, and it's sort of classic John Mackey style. You know, it's just the way John's mind works. He came to the investors and said, you know, I know we've had a rough year, but I figured out the, the problem. I know what we need to do. And he said, what we need to do is open a really big store. It was just too small. We didn't have a big enough store to put in a full selection of grocery products. So I wanted to have a real grocery store where you could do all of your shopping there, not just pick up a few items. We relocated it to a bigger location and merged with one of our competitor stores at the time, Clarksville Natural Grocery. Changed the name because they didn't want to be called Safer Away, and we didn't want to be called Clarksville, so we changed the name to Whole Foods Market. Now, there were a few co-ops that were around that did that, but a really a grocery store format was really something quite new. It really was a success from the start. We figured if we liked it, probably other people would like it too, and that turned out to be very much the correct assumption, is that first Whole Foods Market store just took off and was a success from the very first day. Nobody really expected it. I always put this out as we were a bunch of hippies that nobody expected it to amount to much, and it really did flourish. Ten persons are known dead and eight others are missing after torrential rainstorms flooded Austin, Texas. Dick Ellis of KTBC Austin reports. A cloudburst dumped about six inches of rain in a few hours in the hills around Austin, and Shoal Creek went on a rampage. Waters rose over 20 feet in a matter of minutes, trapping people in their homes and in their cars. They call it the 100-year flood, which means that you know the probability of something to that magnitude uh, wouldn't happen more than maybe once a century. Record crews were busy throughout the night, as was EMS and APD, who reported over 100 calls for assistance in the early morning hours. Businesses along North Lamar were among the hardest hit. We didn't know the magnitude until we came to work for our, our early morning shift the next day when we came to seeing the store completely decimated. We had eight feet of water in the store, so we were really almost bankrupt uh, before we really got going. I mean, the store had only been open about eight or nine months. Fortunately for us, we had a very dedicated team member base, and all of our stakeholders came and saved us. Our, our suppliers fronted us new inventory. Our investors put in new capital. The bank loaned us more money. The team members worked uh, for free until we got back open again. Customers came in and helped us clean up the store, in fact. There were many customers came and pitched up uh, alongside of us and, and helped us dig out of the muck. The next time we all got together, John said, well, hey, good news, we're, you know, we're staying open. And oh, um, I can't even describe the feeling. It was really, <laughs> that's crazy I'm talking about now, thinking about it. It did awaken in my consciousness the first inkling I had about stakeholders was quite aware that there were these different parts of the business that cared about us, that all of them did. And in a sense, that helped me realize that I cared about them and that we cared about them and that we have responsibilities to, to try to do, the right, to do the right thing by them. I remember our opening day when we reopened again and Craig Weller and I had been there all night, to, you know, because we were, you know, just couldn't go home. There were so many things to do and you know, other people were there too. And I remember him saying, okay, open the door. Here we go, guys. And, oh, wow, you know, and we started again. Really all the stakeholders came in and said, we don't want Whole Foods to die. We love Whole Foods. And uh, they didn't let us die. They used to say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But nowadays, some consumers think apples are forbidden fruit. 
that day that we called Al Our Sunday was a big deal. And it really made a difference, not only for Hope It's Market, but for the whole food industry. 60 Minutes had a show on looking at the growth regulator, Alar, that was used on apples. And they brought in the concept that we're using this growth regulator on, on a fruit that school children have as their, the primary fruit that they eat. Some say Alar is a health risk. The Food and Drug Administration told me there's no way to wash off Alar from an apple. So everybody started looking for organic apples because organic was the only thing that really was a guarantee they weren't using this growth regulator. And so, like, overnight, our apples were just going like crazy. People were scared. You naturally had the government reassuring people that uh, this was no danger to anyone. At the same time, people were worried about cancer. Yes, it costs more. We're willing to pay the price at this point instead of uh, consuming carcinogens. I think you can kind of understand the organic movement, the natural food movement, the local food movement. All of these, uh, the anti-GMO movement, they're all protest or they're all rejections of the industrialization of agriculture. When you really know and appreciate food and want good food, you realize that the way that it's grown, the way that it's processed, the way that it's handled has so much to do with the quality of the food that you ultimately have to eat. So we said, do we want to eat that ourselves? And do we feel right to sell that to people if there's questions about it? Federal officials are also questioning the danger of apples that have been treated with Alar in light of lots of conflicting evidence. From A to Z, everybody's concerned about what's, what's in the produce. From now on, I'm going to shop organic. I'm going to try. Of course, there was a concern that some stores were actually putting falsely on that something was organic. So that you know, eventually led us to the Organic Production Act of 1990. Everything we were putting out there as a suggestion for regulation had to be something that would work for all farmers and producers, no matter where you were. Until it's really out to the public that this is happening now, you just still are kind of crossing your fingers and hoping it's going to work. And it did. There was this tremendous momentum, but it was also this string of acquisitions that came one after another. I mean, we became a, a bigger company very quickly, and the experience was pretty heady, pretty exciting. It was a very expansive experience, and, and this, uh, this wonderful excitement about sharing new ideas from people who were doing things slightly differently. We learned a lot from Bread and Circus. Bread and Circus contributed the perishables and the coordinator structure to Whole Foods. They were the best at selling fresh food, and they had this structure that kind of supported that. Whole Foods bought Bread and Circus uh, in 1992. We were kind of six stores, and it was kind of like these hippies down in Texas we heard about occasionally. We used to joke that we got bought by the Almond Brothers, and all these guys came in with the bell bottoms and the long hippie hair. And we were like, wow, this is, uh, this, is, this is really different than we were used to in Boston. Whole Foods has a fantastic culture for learning. And what Whole Foods brought to Bread and Circus, which we were really lacking, was that real sense of running a business that really empowers people and really gets the best out of people. You stopped feeling like you were employees. You really started to feel like you were team members. Here's Whole Foods having stores in Boston, stores in North Carolina, stores in Texas, stores in California. And they could do it because they really empowered people and let them take responsibility to run things the way they needed to be run right there. I think it's what's really allowed us to grow the way we have grown to, to the company that we have today. Whole Foods Market cares about welfare of animals because uh, we think they're worthy of being cared about. Issues were coming into play on hormones, and then we then the big foie gras uh, issue came up. Foie gras is, you know, when you're force feeding ducks and geese. I asked our uh, specialty coordinator at the time, "Do you want to go with me to see a foie gras production plant?" We went to upstate New York and brought along a veterinarian from the Humane Society of the U.S. 
seen the production where they're actually taking pneumatic tubes and just literally forcing it down their throats. And then just seeing the ones that were done just kind of wallowing off and just kind of huddling in the corner, it was really bad. And uh, they felt that this was just what they were doing was fine. And at that point, one by one, we got each of the regions to agree. So then 1997, we could actually declare that Hope It's Market would not be selling foie gras. It's actually to this day, some of the animal welfare groups really point to that as being a, a very big deal for them. Animals feel fear and animals feel pain. And that is very well documented in the scientific literature. In my first work with Whole Foods, I worked with them on implementing the animal welfare auditing at the uh, meat packing plants using an objective scoring system. And this uh, scoring system looks at directly observable things. I'm interested in practical improvements on the ground, not just a bunch of paperwork that looks nice, but real change happening on the ground. So the auditing programs that I have developed emphasize things I can directly look at. We pulled together uh, of this multi-stakeholder uh, group that includes scientists, animal welfare activists, uh, people who are experts in, in, in all these areas. And this group came up with uh, just a really great uh, program that eventually turned into the, the five-step gap program. We set up our animal welfare standards to kind of have a race to the top so that people can become more conscious that there are these different levels of humane treatment. And then we had to turn around and convince thousands of farms that it was worthwhile getting audited. That was really the big challenge because there were, it's, you're talking about changing growing practices that people have had and have done in their families for, for many years. I know our cows personally, and, and I feel obligated to them to give them the best that we can give them. For us, it was just, what's the right thing to do? And that's what we did. There had been environmental groups talking about seafood and seafood sustainability, but there was quite a hardline approach stop eating seafood, boycott this, boycott that. It wasn't obviously taken into consideration that people wanted to eat fish. And of course, there, and then there were the fishermen that were obviously concerned about their livelihood. I got a call from World Wildlife Group and they said, you know, you ought to go to New York. There's this new group called the Marine Stewardship Council. And I think you, you ought to hear what they say and really was blown away by what they did. Because this was the concept of multi-stakeholder, of having input from everybody and everybody being involved in the standards. Whole Foods Market was the one that really marketed and told the story about the Marine Stewardship Council better than anybody in the world. The biggest challenge was having enough MSC certified fish to sell because when you are promoting it, and then our customers go to the case and say, okay, where is it? And you only have one or two species to sell, that's a challenge, that's a real hard sell because then they wonder about the rest of the fish. Are these sustainable or not? So that's where we started working with Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Safina Institute. And the great thing about that is that we got some help on what are the red species, red meaning unsustainable. So we set a goal for ourselves to have no red-rated wild seafood species by 2013, and we did it a year earlier. The unique thing that Whole Foods Market did is that rather than hiding the fact that we did have some species of fish in our seafood cases that environmental groups would rate red as unsustainable, we use that as a way to really educate our customers. We're interested too is not all about sales. We really want to provide the best product for you and for the environment. It's all one big world. And when you're helping one part, you're helping another part of it.
Well, you know, Manhattan, make it there, make it anywhere. There's, you know, seven to eight million people living on that island. At the time, we didn't feel we were good enough. We felt, frankly, intimidated by all the New York retailers and just the toughness of Manhattan. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then as a team, we said, you know, we need to be the best natural food and organic food store. We need to be Whole Foods Market. So when we opened Chelsea, customers immediately fell in love with the store. And Chelsea quickly grew into the high volume store it is today. And that was really the store that put us on the map. And we said, you know, the next store we're gonna do, we have to do a bit bigger. Columbus Circle, um, in terms of changing the company, it, it gave Whole Foods a real swagger. Right after Columbus Circle, the, the stock broke $100 for the first time. So it was kind of like our stamp of approval from Wall Street that Whole Foods was really a special place. It was a major inflection point in terms of Whole Foods' success being here and then going to this level. As we came into the 2000s, we had some times where the comps were north of 10%, even some 10, 12%. I mean, these are extraordinary numbers in food retailing. We had been growing for gross sake because we thought we could be the largest grocer in the world and that uh, there was anything that could stop us. No matter what we did, it was gonna work. But we had lost our way a little bit with respect to our soul. Part of why Whole Foods has been successful is because I think this culture has continued to grow in a way that draws people to it, to say, that's something I wanna be part of. To do that, the company has to continue to act according to its values, continue to make decisions that show the team members that we actually mean what we say, that we're gonna stand in the world in the way that we believe. The core of Whole Foods is about empowering and lifting up each and every human spirit. The Green Mission program's an all-encompassing, really comprehensive look at what we can do to help the environment. It's a catalyst that allows team members to run with ideas that are good for the environment that also benefit other stakeholders. Up in our Boulder, Colorado store, a handful of team members said, we'd like to offset our energy with wind power. And they started first one year with a portion of, of the energy usage offset by wind. The next year, they expanded it to the full store. Then the STL said to the region, why don't we do the whole region? Then instead, it was like, why don't we do the whole company? And that was a, I'd say, a, a watershed moment because it really crystallized green mission around the company. We've had a number of firsts. We were the first grocery store to have solar-powered panels on rooftop. The first company to get rid of the plastic bags at the checkouts. First company to use waste cooking oil as a fuel source for a backup generator and on-site combined heat and power for a kitchen. We were the first store to use fuel cells. The Brooklyn store is a, is a really neat site. It's on the Gowanus River. We decided to take it and make it as environmentally sound and sustainable as possible. So it's the first grocery store in the U.S. to be LEED Platinum certified, which is the highest level of certification by a third party. And the first store to have Gotham Greens, which is a greenhouse on top of the roof. We don't want to just be the status quo and do what we've always done. We want to be leading edge and continue to challenge ourselves to get better. We wanted to find a way to give back to the global communities where the coffee and the tea and the rice and the cacao and the spices and the baskets and the apparel, where everything comes from. We didn't really know how to do that successfully and sustainably, and by that meaning not through aid. You know, we wanted to make a real difference. Let's tackle poverty through Whole Foods Market's philosophy of entrepreneurship so that ultimately the people living in poverty can be empowered to change their own life. Microcredit is a transformative vehicle. It is a small loan, usually $300 or less. Low interest, no contract, no collateral. A microcredit loan can enable someone to purchase a goat and sell goat milk, and then maybe purchase another goat and you know, basically improve living conditions slowly but surely put themselves on the road to a better life through their own hard work. We're now supporting 5 million people in 61 countries. The Team Member Volunteer Program is an opportunity for Whole Foods Market team members to experience firsthand the work of Whole Planet, 
and the product that we source from around the world. John wanted everyone to understand why the foundation is part of Whole Foods Market. He wanted people to get some of the answers to their questions. My favorite thing about the Whole Foods Market team member volunteer program is how it actually changes the life of the team member also. We are redefining capitalism. We are redefining what a corporate foundation is. We focus on the thing that we can control, which is giving access to capital as directly as possible to the world's poor so they can invest in themselves. Quality requires cost. Everybody in the value chain needs to make a living. The farmers, the workers that process it, everybody needs to make a living wage. Whole Trade is simply put Whole Foods Market's ethical trading program. It's a certification partnership program, so we're working with independent certifiers to verify conditions on the farms where we buy our food. We're talking about environmental conditions as well as labor conditions. Additionally included in the Whole Trade guarantee, of course, is that the products meet our quality standards. We're guaranteeing that more money is getting through to either small farmers or to farm workers. And we're also able to generate an additional benefit to the Whole Planet Foundation on all of our retail sales so that we can support their work alleviating poverty around the world. There are people growing great products all over the world, small indigenous farmers. Their problem is how do you get to market? Creating these direct relationships with producers whether it's coffee or spices or mangoes or bananas, brings more of the dollar that that product realizes at retail down to the farm level and creates a greater benefit. I think that that's something that Whole Foods does as well or better than any other grocery company in the world. Whole Kids Foundation started as an idea. It was right at the moment when the company was returning to its roots in health food and really investing in education for people about how to feed their bodies well. What kids eat at school is important. When we started this idea of improving school food, we had to overcome these huge barriers. Salad bars are easy. You put a salad bar out, kids eat more fruits and vegetables. Gardens are, are an interesting topic. When kids grow vegetables, kids eat vegetables. So when you have a great garden and a beautiful salad bar, you get a compounded effect. We have kids who um, couldn't perform in the classroom that when they get out in the garden, just come alive and really drink in the education. This work is, is making a difference in people's lives. You know, I, I, I can't even imagine that we wouldn't have done this. If you think about our mission as a company is to, is to bring healthy food to the world in some sort of simple terms. No one said, hey, bring healthy food to some communities. No, that's not the mission of Whole Foods. The mission of Whole Foods is bring healthy food to the world. So all communities, right? What began to trouble me was this idea that there are so many communities that don't have access to fresh, healthy food. And in fact, if you go on the USDA website, you'll find it's over 6,000 communities that don't have fresh, healthy food within a couple of miles. In many cases, those communities don't have good operating public transportation. They just don't have the same set of choices that, that we enjoy in so many of our communities and the communities that we serve. And I began to look a little further at the uh, public health statistics and found the disparity in longevity. But it's 10 or 12 years from the city of Detroit to outside the city of Detroit. And that raised moral questions for me about why is that? And particularly given what we know about the impact of healthy food and our skill set as grocers, why can't we do something about it? We ventured into Detroit, opened the store in uh, June of 2013, very much to a skeptical public. Of course, you know, the uh, national media would say that there's nothing going on here in Detroit. But as you see, Whole Foods came and it's booming. I was born and raised in Detroit. This store is really beneficial to our neighborhood, let me say that, because um, we had nothing else, no food, other than like pre-made stuff that wasn't really good for us. 
We do adjust our business model for these communities. Our costs are much lower, both on rent and operating costs. The stores are a little smaller, so it's a combination of keeping the costs down, uh, try to get the size right for the community, involving the community from the beginning and what selection of products they want to see. As much as they bash Detroit and talk about the downturns, there, there are pockets of Detroit that's really aspiring to grow and get forward. And in time, it'll turn around. It just needs places like this to help spur the activity. What's happened is this, this wonderful, uh, I think, contribution to the Detroit community. And from the success, we decided to take the next step, and we opened one in mid-city New Orleans at the corner of Broad and Bienville. And then we took another step and signed a store in downtown Newark, New Jersey. Mayor Booker was reaching out to us, asking us to do this sort of thing. And then finally, the one that we're working on right now, uh, Mayor Emanuel called and asked if we would consider doing something on the south side of Chicago, where the access difference is um, remarkable between the north side of the city and the south side. And so we chose Inglewood, which is a, uh, one of the most challenged underserved communities on the south side of Chicago. People said, what is Whole Foods doing in Englewood? That makes no sense at all. Well, you know what? We do stuff that doesn't make sense. There's a richness to America that we need to explore and we need to serve. When we got started at Whole Foods, we were seen as so far out, so marginal, so crazy. You know, at Whole Foods Market, we have the opportunity to think big. If you're just trying to think what you can make better with something that's already happening, you're not thinking hard enough. Whole Foods has so many opportunities. And you know, Whole Planet and Whole Kids Foundation and Whole Trade, that didn't exist a few years ago. That was all something that just recently came up. We just realized that there was more opportunity for us to do good and things that we could work on. A lot of it in this company really bubbles up from, you know, from the ground up. Let's take full advantage of this time that we find ourselves in history and the chance to make a real impact in this world. Whole Foods today is the end result of the dreams that team members and suppliers and investors and all the stakeholders had many years ago. And those dreams have been materialized because people had the, the vision and the passion and the courage to dream and then make those dreams come true.